4th of August last marked the centenary of Ralph Wallenberg's death in the Dingo municipality, which is, I understand, to the east of Stockholm in Sweden. Today, your conference, Man Amidst, Amidst Humanity, in Humanity, celebrates the moral and physical courage of Ralph Wallenberg, recognized as one of the righteous among the nations, who saved some 100,000 Hungarian Jews from the Shoah of the Holocaust. For every person who takes the equal dignity of human beings seriously, the life of Raoul Wallenberg has a distinct moral and ethical significance. He was a true modern moral hero. The grasp, to grasp what he accomplished, our starting point is 1944. President Roosevelt asked the United States War Refugee Board to help save the Jews of Hungary from threatened mass murder by the Nazis. The War Refugee Board then asked its representative in Sweden, Ivar Olsen, to find a person to do the work. The board's offices in Sweden were in the same building as the trading firm where Ralph Wallenberg worked. Wallenberg's boss, Karl Müller, who was a Hungarian Jew, recommended Wallenberg. And he was offered an almost impossible job. By this time, the Nazis had destroyed every other Jewish community in occupied Europe. Even though he knew that Germany was losing the war, Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann had arrived in Hungary, resolved to murder every single Jew there. Eichmann organized daily transports of 10 to 12,000 Jews to the death camps. In those camps, as Eli Weitzel says, there, was, there were only two sorts of people, those who were there to murder and those who were there to be murdered. More than 400,000 Hungarian Jews from rural Hungary had been forcibly transported to the death camps. Most of them were murdered in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Their suitcases with their names, their glasses, their hair, their clogs, their shoes, their round bows still attest to those murders. There were 230,000 Jews still in Budapest. Born to privilege, Wallenberg was the child of a banking family. He had the option to sit out World War II safe in neutral Sweden. But for him not to act against the genocide and evil would have been passively to accept that evil. For him, omitting to act would itself have amounted to the wrongful action of acquiescence. So he said yes when asked to go to Budapest. He could not be a bystander to evil. Sweden gave him a diplomatic passport and appointed him as Legion Secretary of the Swedish Legation of Budapest. In July 1944, Wallenberg arrived with 650 protective passports to Jews who had links with Sweden. The Swedish Legation had already been issuing provi provisional passports and certificates to Jews with links to Sweden to try and be of assistance to them. Wallenberg immediately began to expand the rescue operation. He set up an office and ultimately employed over 300 Jews to run the office. He told them that they should remove their yellow stars because they had Swedish diplomatic protection. He developed a special protective Swedish passport, the Schutzpass, whose avowed purpose was to render the holder immune to deportation. This action saved the lives of about 20,000 of the Jewish community in Hungary. With American money, he rented some 30 buildings. He designated them extraterritorial buildings under a Swedish flag to give their residents safe houses. He placed some 35,000 Jews in these buildings. As the Soviet army approached Budapest, the Nazis intensified their assaults on Budapest's Jewish community. Helped by local Hungarian Nazis, they organized their units around the Jewish ghetto for the purpose of carrying out a massacre. Wallenberg directly confronted the Nazi commander, warning him that if he authorized the massacre, he, Wallenberg, would ensure that he was prosecuted after the war for crimes against humanity. The commander cancelled the assault. Wallenberg's actions saved over 50,000 Jews. 
What stands out is Raoul Wallenberg's choice to resist what was happening. In the parallel world of terrible, terrible evil, created by Hitler's reign of terror, he was one of the good people who put their own lives at risk to help Jews. He didn't look away, he didn't turn his back and walk away, and unlike so many, he was not indifferent. He bribed, manipulated, confronted, threatened, and annoyed the Nazis in order to save the lives of Hungarian Jews. He gave the Jews inventive Swedish documents, hid them in safe houses, and pulled them out of, de out of death marches or from the river Danube or off trains bound for the death camps. His work endangered his life. His car was blown up. The Nazis fired their rifles over his head. He had to find safe places to sleep at night. But he didn't search for fudged formulas to deny the imperative to act and to do what he could. There were many who did nothing in the face of the industrialized genocide and the destruction of European Jewish civilization. The, the Irish government of the day sat on its hands. And even after the death camps were liberated, the Irish government denied Jews refuge in this state. To those who asked, what could I have done? The answer must be, look at what Raoul Wallenberg did. When the Soviets occupied Budapest after the defeat of the Nazis, Wallenberg's efforts to save Jews attracted their attention. He approached the Soviets and requested them to consider his plan to help the Hungarian Jews recover their rightful stake and dignity in Hungary. Under Soviet escort, he returned to his own office after making this request. He told his colleagues that he had to go back to Russian headquarters. He told them he was not quite sure whether he was going there as a guest or as a prisoner. He was never seen again as a free man. The Soviets, ever took, uh, the Soviets refused ever to account in an honest and verifiable way for the fate and whereabouts of Raoul Wallenberg. He was arrested for no legitimate reason, never accused of any real crime, never accorded a proper trial. Wallenberg disappeared into the Soviet prison system. His unlawful forced disappearance was, I believe, itself a crime against humanity. We must be clear in our consciousness that what the Soviets did to him was because of what he did and proposed to do for Hungarian Jews. His objective was to persuade the Soviets to restore full civil, political, and economic rights to the dispossessed Jews of Hungary, to help them reconstruct their lives. He was disappeared, not despite this moral heroism, but because of his moral heroism. It is absurdly and savagely unjust that the man who gave help to so many was himself denied help when he needed it. That the man who sought to give the victims of inhumanity some humane legal protection was himself deprived of even minimal due protection, and that the man who saved so many from forcible disappearance was not himself saved from forcible disappearance. I believe the passage of time will never erase this injustice done to Raoul Wallenberg. Moreover, the passage of time <coughs> can never excuse suppressing any evidence that may shed light on what was his ultimate fate. The value of today's conference is that it contributes to ensuring that the act of memory does not become passive. It actively helps to keep the truths of the show ready at hand in our cultural memory. The act of memory, this Zaho, is a moral act. Eli Wiseman cautions us, I quote, whatever you do, remember the moral dimension. If you study engineering, or architecture, or the arts, or music, literature, Whatever you do in your life, remember always there must be a moral dimension. The pursuit of knowledge divorced from moral values cannot enhance, uh, cannot enhance humanity in any way. In relation to the Shoah, the moral dimension is an imperative to defend the historical truth against profaning histories. The pursuit of knowledge should be mindful of certain moral facts. First, we cannot find a meaning in the show. No one can speak on behalf of the silent figures we see on black and white film reels 
walking in line to the gas chambers, marked for death by their yellow stars, who ultimately finished up in the crematorium, where they were turned into smoke and ash. We cannot gather their tears or screams and turn them into words of explanation. It trivializes the shower to say that we can find any meaning in it. As Primo Levi wrote, there was no why in Auschwitz, nor was there any why in any of the other death camps. But we must not forget exactly what happened. This is a moral imperative. What happened was a unique historical event. True, the show was the culmination of a millennium of murder from 1096, when the Crusaders liquidated Jewish communities on the march to the Holy Land, right down to the show when six million Jews were murdered and European Jewish civilization substantially destroyed. But the singularity of the show lies, as George Steiner teaches us, in its execution by highly intelligent and cultured members of an enlightened society who listened to Schubert and read philosophy. They read philosophy in the evening and killed men, women, and children in the morning and afternoon. He describes the scene in which the cries of Belgian Jews taken by trains along the tracks passing by the concert hall were simply ignored as the audience continued to enjoy the music. Using its perverted science, education, the arts, industry, economics, law, medicine, and coercive power, that enlightened society mercilessly pursued its objective to liquidate a whole people, the Jews of Europe. Second, we must defend the truth about the Shoah against the profaning of history and the perverting of language. There are those who deny the Shoah. When General Dwight Eisenhower saw firsthand the horrors of the death camps, he called the world's, world's press to witness what he'd seen. He said, and I quote, I know that someday there's going to be somebody to come along and say that this is all myth, that this never happened. To create as many witnesses as possible, he ordered all his soldiers to witness the horror that was there. He also required German civilians who lived nearby to parade through the camps. The essential moral point is that we must never fall into the trap of assuming that there are two points of view on whether the Shoah did or did not happen. And yet there are still people who assert that it was a hoax. What do they seek to achieve? They seek to revive fascism unhinged from the horror. As De Deborah Lipstadt says, if you want to make fascism a viable contemporary political alternative, you first have to do away with the Holocaust. But we must realize too that anti-Semitism is not exclusively the property of fascism. In the extremities of their sweeping arcs, right-wing extremism, left-wing extremism and religious fundamentalism intersect in their readiness to spread this lethal, this, this lethal prejudice. Iran's President Ahmadinejad has repeat, repeatedly threatened a nuclear holocaust against Israel whilst denying the show. Moreover, modern anti-Semitism obsessively singles out Israel for disproportionate forms of condemnation that barely conceal a denial of Israel's right to exist. There are also those who relativize the show. They try to place it in an excusing or reductive historical perspective. They assert that because genocide has happened throughout recorded history, Hitler's final solution was nothing special. What the German Nazis did does not stand alone, they argue, in history. And in the 20th century, Stalin did it first with his clergies and gulags. Or as Robert Farrison argued in a book, which Noam Chomsky wrote an introduction. What happened to the Jews was a tragedy, not intended by the Nazis as an act of genocide. In any event, genocide on the scale the Nazis are accused of was not technically feasible. Others argue that the German army was really fighting to prevent communist domination of Europe and the fate of the Jews was just some sort of incidental outcome. On this issue, the Shoah is regarded as merely one of countless examples of man's inhumanity to man. And there are those who trivialize the Shoah. If the word Holocaust is used as a metaphor to describe mishaps or poor outcomes, it robs the word of its moral force. 
When Philip Morris put advertisements in magazines seeking to identify smokers with ghettoized Jews, the corporation profaned the world and drained it of moral imagination. The advertisement had a map of Amsterdam, with an area near the traditional Jewish quarter cordoned off and marked, quote, smoking section. It's important to actively oppose these phenomena. The show are denied, the show are relativized, and the show are trivialized. We cannot deal with the future if the past is denied, relativized, or trivialized. Without a true understanding of the past, there can be no secure, civilized future. We must not lose the words we need to speak honestly about what the victims of the show have suffered and experienced. To say that the show was a singular event is not to engage in a sort of moral bookkeeping that in any way claims the Jews have suffered more than any other group. We must neither forget nor try to rank the sufferings of all victims of genocide, and we must be courageous enough to speak to the threats in our own time. It would be an unforgivable, an unforgivable flight for responsibility not to ask why the United Nations and the international community are not doing more to stop mass murder or threatened mass murder in the world today. I recognize that the design of the United Nations is intended to provide the world with a comprehensive public order system, but I cannot see how the power to veto a humanitarian intervention resolution by the United Nations Security Council, a power that is vested for historical reasons in an exclusive club of five permanent members, can morally validate political inaction in the face of barbarism. It's not enough to bear witness. We must also honour our fundamental moral obligation to protect our common humanity against inhumanity. A member of the international community could have impeded the Shoah had it acted in time. The states neither spoke up nor acted against the mass murder of European Jewish civilization. Hitler and his henchmen always felt reassured that they could act with impunity when the international community kept silent in the face of Nazi outrages. Silence was interpreted as acquiescence, thus acquiescence helped evil to flourish. And so the Nazis and their collaborators were able to use the fires of the Shoah to turn European Jewish civilization to smoke and ash. Martin Luther King in more recent times put the point this way, again I quote, the greatest tragedy of this generation which history will record is not the vitriolic words of those who hate or the aggressive acts of others, but the appalling silence of the good people. It is, a fear it is a severe indictment of our international legal and political order. For example, that Assad remains in power in Syria and mass murders Syrian people with impunity. It is morally absurd that Ahmadinejad still rules Iran, an act of denial of the Shoah who has promised to use nuclear missiles to hurt to turn the state of Israel to smoke and ash. And the silence of so many that the non-aligned states in the face of his threats will surely undermine their moral authority to speak on important issues of international concern. In the appalling silence of the good people, Ralph Wallenberg's brave humanity stood out. He knew that to remain free, we must preserve the rule of law. True, the Nazi empire of terror was not lawless, but its arsenal of laws was used by educated people, lawyers and judges, to license oppression, slavery, and mass murder. Wallenberg knew that to live under the rule of law in its right substantive sense, we must value our fundamental rights and freedoms, bear the responsibilities they entail, and constantly renew the democratic attitude of equal concern and respect for all people. It is good, therefore, that Dr. Robert Rosette will speak to the question, why will Wallenberg? Tim Cole will examine the geographies of rescue in which Wallenberg strove to create safe refuges in the then lethal, racist urban space. Tanya Schultz will tackle the memory of Wallenberg in art and popular culture, and Dr. Maria Schmidt will consider the dilemma of man amidst inhumanity. Gabriel Talai assesses the place of the Holocaust in the Hungarian school curriculum, and in Dag Sebastian Amanda and Yako Barzilai will, in a figurative sense, bring Raoul Wallenberg home to us today. Your conference will pursue important themes. The theme of art and the shower is most vexing to the moral imagination. The philosopher, 
Jürgen Habermas wrote that the Shoah has changed the basis of the continuity of the conditions of life within history. The fundamental question for artists is, how do you represent the truth of the Shoah in responsible memory? History is anchored to a factual record. The historian probes with an eye to marshalling events into a coherent and truthful narrative. And law too is anchored to a factual record. After World War II, realising the role that the law could play in accomplishing an accurate and reliable record of the Shoah, the Allies agreed upon a judicialised response in Nuremberg to Nazi crimes. Telford Taylor, Chief Prosecutor at Nuremberg, argued that the fact-finding trial process would provide a public forum for historical education. The claim that the idiom of art, for example, imagined in literature in the forms of prose or poetry can safeguard historical truth is contested and there's a sharp conflict of views. I do not have in mind art that comes directly from people who experience the horrors of the Shoah, for example, the poems of Paul Celan or art that does not represent the Shoah but has acquired an additional balance because the artist was a victim of Nazi crimes. I have in mind, for example, the lino print of Moon Landscape by Petra Ginsu, who was taken from the Prague ghetto and murdered in Auschwitz in his 16th year. Late Colonel Ilan Ramon brought the artwork into space with him in 2003 on the tragic shuttle mission Columbia, that sadly perished. For art about the show, I suggest that the key questions are, is it possible for the artist to search for historical clarification in the world of fiction? and imagination. If you aestheticize the shower, do you then trivialize it? Is there a real and substantial risk that the very act of fictionalizing or creating something new can be exploited by those who assert that the shower was a made-up propaganda device? And can the artist avoid becoming merely a voyeur? Lawrence Langer argues that the artistic imagination can serve the interests of responsible memory. He wrote that, and I quote, only art can convey the fullest meaning of the Holocaust experience. For him, the artistic imagination has the power to help people to grasp the, or not the enormity. Theodore Adorno has been read as saying that writing a poem about Auschwitz is barbaric. His point is that the power to create art must be overwhelmed by the enormity of the genocide, cruelty, and enslavement. The imperative is not to imagine but to record the facts. I bring up these questions simply to make the point that the question of imaginative creation in relation to the shower bristles with hard questions. Can art about the shower become a muscle of true moral memory, or is it more likely to become a tool of inevitable distortion? The discussion you will have on these issues is of importance. The challenge, of course, is to keep faith with the civilized values Ral Wallenberg lived and died for. We can do this by working to make practical advances in the protection and promotion of human rights and equality in our world, in the treatment of war victims by adversaries in times of armed conflict, the treatment of refugees who seek haven from persecution. In Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, along the Avenue of the Righteous, which is dedicated to remembering those who risked their lives to save Jews from the Shoah, a tree grows in Ral Wallenberg's memory. And in the Mishnah, there is the thought that to murder a person is in effect to cause a whole world to perish and that to save another person's life is in effect to save a whole world. In Budapest during the six months he worked there from July 1944 to January 1945, Raoul Wallenberg saved a single human life, a whole world, 100,000 times. In a world where there are people who deny the shower or relativize the shower or trivialize the shower, where there are people who incite or seek to create the conditions or weapons to refer the genocide against the Jewish people, remembering Raoul Wallenberg and the victims and survivors of the Shoah is itself a deeply meaningful moral act of memory. I wish this moral act of memory, this Sakor, your conference, success. The historical fact of the Shoah can only be kept alive in memory through acts of memory. In your important act of memory today, even as you remember the evil in humanity, you memorialize human good. I wish the work of your conference well, and again, thank you for asking me to open it. <laughs>